We might as well admit it, everyone wants to be liked. William James once said, one of the deepest drives of human nature is the desire to be appreciated. The longing to be liked, to be held in esteem, to be a person whom others seek out is fundamental in all of us. On this side, you'll discover how to enjoy easy, natural, and pleasing relationships with others, how to be somebody you'd like to know. A poll was taken among some high school students asking them what they most desired. By overwhelming majority, the students answered that they wanted to be popular. Older people have this same urge. Indeed, it is doubtful if anyone ever outlives the desire to be highly regarded or to have the affection of friends and associates. The feeling of not being wanted or needed is one of the most devastating of all human emotions. Being needed by others is absolutely necessary for emotional stability and happiness. Yet it is sad to realize how many people suffer from a sense of isolation. I was at a luncheon once when a young doctor rushed in to take his place at the table. He looked frazzled as he sat down with a weary sigh. If only the telephone would stop ringing, he complained. I can't get anywhere because people call me all the time. I wish I could put a silencer on that phone. An elderly doctor at the table spoke up. I know how you feel. I used to feel that way myself. But you should be thankful the phone does ring. Be glad people want and need you. Then he added pathetically, nobody ever calls me anymore. I would like to hear the telephone ring again. Nobody wants me and nobody needs me. I'm a has-been. The feeling of not being wanted or needed can produce frustration, illness, and even aging. It is not only a sad way to live, but it is damaging to the human psyche. If you're feeling useless, for your own sake, do something about it. Try getting out of yourself for a while. Stop feeling sorry for yourself and find a way instead to provide a service for someone else. Think about people who are less fortunate than you who need help. Volunteer for a worthwhile cause. Not only will you find the esteem we all need, but others will greatly benefit by what you give. It's ironic, but people who deliberately strive to be popular often fail in the attempt. Popularity sought purely for its own sake can be a superficial goal which encourages superficial results. On the other hand, we all know someone who has that extra something, a magnetism that comes from inner confidence. Without even trying, these people never seem to lack for friends. Before we begin talking about ways to improve your relationships, let me warn you that no one, no matter how terrific, is liked by everyone. It's a curious quirk in human nature, but there are certain people with whom we simply don't click. Even the Bible recognizes this fact about human nature, for it says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. The Bible is a very realistic book. It knows people, their infinite possibilities, as well as their imperfections. The Bible advised the disciples that they should do their best to get along with the people in the villages they visited. But if they still couldn't do so, after trying sincerely, they were to shake off the very dust of the village from their feet. And whosoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet 
for a testimony against them. This is all by way of saying that if you don't achieve perfect popularity with everyone, don't let it bother you too much. Countless people have never mastered the knack of being sought after, and it's not for lack of trying. Some people even go to extremes, acting in a manner they don't really enjoy, all because of their intense desire to be liked. Unfortunately, this desire is often merely a search for a superficial kind of popularity. Having said that, now let me tell you that there are certain procedures which can make you a person that other people like to be with without becoming artificial or putting on an act. You can enjoy satisfactory personal relationships even if you are a difficult person or are by nature shy and retiring. Here are some suggestions. First, try to be a comfortable type of person, the kind that others can be easy with. Some people always keep a barrier between themselves and the world. It's a strain just to be with them. A stiff, unresponsive individual never quite meshes into a group. It's hard to know what they're feeling or how they're going to react. They make you feel a little uneasy. But a comfortable kind of person is easygoing and natural. They have a pleasant, kindly, genial way about them. Being with them is a bit like wearing an old hat or an old pair of shoes. It is important to try to be natural. Someone who is easy to be with usually has a big soul quality about them. Little people, those who are overly concerned about their place or position, are often stiff and easily offended. Although there are many characteristics that contribute to a likable personality, there is one basic trait that surpasses all others. That is a sincere and forthright interest in and love for people. If you're having trouble with relationships, Perhaps you should look for elements in your personality that cause strain when you're with others. Don't automatically assume that other people don't like you because of something wrong with them. Perhaps the trouble is within yourself. Finding and eliminating such problems requires scrupulous honesty and may also involve the help of a professional counselor. The scratchy elements of your personality may be qualities you've acquired over the years. Perhaps you assumed them as a defense, or they may be the result of attitudes developed in your younger days. Regardless of their origin, they can be eliminated. A man once came to us seeking help for problems with personal relationships. He was about 35 years old, and such an appealing-looking man, it seems surprising that people shouldn't like him. Yet he proceeded to outline an unhappy set of circumstances to illustrate his dismal failure with people. I do my best, he said. I've tried to put into practice the rules I've been taught about getting along with people, but I get nowhere with the effort. People just don't like me. After talking with him, the trouble became apparent. His manner of speech conveyed a persistently critical attitude. This attitude was thinly veiled, but still it was there. He had an unattractive way of pursing his lips which indicated a kind of primness or reproof for everybody, as if he felt just a bit superior and disdainful. 
Isn't there some way to change myself so people will like me, he demanded. Isn't there some way I can stop unconsciously rubbing people the wrong way? The young man was decidedly self-centered and egotistical. The person he really liked was himself. Every statement, every attitude was unconsciously measured in terms of how it made him look. He was irritable with people and picked on them in his own mind, though few outward conflicts developed. Inwardly, he was trying to make everyone over to suit himself. Unconsciously, people realized this. In their minds, they erected barriers against him. Since he was being unpleasant to people in his thoughts, it followed that he was less than warm in his behavior. He was polite enough and managed not to be boorish and unpleasant, but people unconsciously felt coolness in him, so they gave him the brush off, and with good reason, for in his mind he had already brushed them off. In a sense, he liked himself too well, and to build up his self-esteem, he put others down. He was suffering from too much self-love. To change his situation, he had to be taught how to love other people and to forget himself, which was, of course, a complete reversal of his habits. He was bewildered and baffled when his difficulty was outlined to him. But since he was sincere and meant business, he practiced his suggested techniques for developing love of others in place of extreme self-love. It took some fundamental changes to accomplish this goal since his egotism was so deeply ingrained. But in the end, he did succeed. One method I suggested was that he make a list of people he had met during the day. For example, the bus driver or the newsboy. Every night before retiring, he was to mentally picture each person on the list. And as he brought each face up before him, he was to think a kindly thought about that person and then pray for them. Each of us has his own world, people we encounter each day or with whom we do business. This man was instructed to pray for those in his own little world. For example, the first person he saw each morning was the elevator man in his apartment house. Normally, he'd say a perfunctory good morning. Now he took the time to have a little chat. He asked the elevator man about his family and about his interests. He found that he had an interesting point of view and some experiences which were quite fascinating. He began to see new values in a person who had previously been a mechanical robot to him. He actually began to like the elevator operator and in turn the elevator operator, who had formed a pretty accurate opinion of the young man, began to reverse his views. They established a friendly relationship. So the process went from person to person on his list. One day the young man said, I've found that the world is filled with interesting people and I never realized it before. When he made that observation, he proved that he was losing himself. And when he did that, as the Bible so wisely tells us, he found himself. In losing himself, he found himself and lots of new friends besides. People began to like him. Learning to pray for other people is a very important step in this process. When you pray for someone, you tend to lift the relationship to a higher level. The best in other people begins to flow out toward you as your best flows toward them. 
In the meeting of the best, in each, a higher understanding is established. Essentially, getting people to like you is merely the other side of liking them. One of the most popular men who lived in the United States in this century was the late Will Rogers, and one of the most characteristic statements he ever made was, I never met a man I didn't like. Now, that may have been a slight exaggeration, but I'm sure Will Rogers didn't think so. That is truly the way he felt about people, and as a result, people opened up to him like flowers to the sun. Another important way to get people to like you is to practice building up their ego. Everyone has a normal desire for feelings of self-importance. If I deflate your ego, and therefore your self-importance, I show my lack of respect for you. Though you may laugh it off, I have indeed wounded you. And while you may exercise charity toward me, unless you are finely developed spiritually, you're not going to like me very much. On the other hand, if I elevate your self-respect and contribute to your feelings of personal worth, I am showing high esteem for your ego. I have helped you to be your best self, and in return, you appreciate my efforts. You are grateful to me. You like me for it. Almost anyone that you help to build up and become a better person will give you his devotion. Build up as many people as you can, but do it sincerely and unselfishly. Do it because you like them and because you recognize their potential. If you do good for people, affection and esteem will flow back to you. Best of all, you will never lack for friends. The basic principles for getting people to like you are simple. Here are 10 practical exercises to help you become someone that you'd like to know. 1. A person's name is very important. When you meet someone, try to remember their name. If you don't, they may feel you're not very interested in them. 2. Be the comfortable sort of person with whom others feel relaxed. Try to make them feel at home with you. Three. Acquire that quality of relaxed, easygoingness so that everyday irritations don't ruffle you. Four, don't be egotistical. Guard against giving the impression that you know it all. Five, try to be an interesting person. Cultivate interests to keep your mind alive. People enjoy being with someone who is stimulating. Six, get those scratchy elements out of your personality. If you suspect there may be bothersome traits you're not aware of, get a friend or perhaps a professional to help you. Seven, attempt to heal the misunderstandings you've had with others. Sincerely drain off your grievances. Eight, practice liking people until it comes naturally to you. Nine, never miss an opportunity to say a word of congratulations upon someone's achievement or express sympathy for their sorrow or disappointment. 10. Strengthen your spiritual life. Then offer strength to others that will help them meet life more effectively. Give strength to people and they will give affection to you. Winston Churchill once wrote about the great British general Tudor. He commanded a division of the British Fifth Army, which faced the powerful German assault in March 1918. The odds were heavily against him, but General Tudor knew how to meet an apparently immovable and undefeatable obstacle. His method was simple. He merely stood and let the obstacle break on him, and he in turn broke the obstacle. Now here is what Churchill said about General Tudor. The impression I had of Tudor was of an iron peg hammered into the frozen ground 
immovable. General Tudor knew how to stand up to an obstacle. Just stand up to it, that's all. Don't whine or complain about it. Don't give way under it. Stand up to it, and it will finally break. You will break it. Something has to break, and it won't be you. It will be the obstacle. People who cringe in front of their challenges not only trip themselves up, but they can often affect a whole team or organization. People like the obstacle man, for example. Here's his story. This obstacle man worked in a large creative organization. He received this name because no matter what suggestion was advanced, his mind instantly latched onto all the possible obstacles in connection with it. One day, the directors of his firm were considering a project which involved considerable expense and some definite hazards, as well as possibilities for success. In a discussion of the venture, the obstacle man would frequently say, just a moment, let's consider the obstacles involved. Now, present at this meeting was another man who said very little, but who was greatly respected by his colleagues for his ability and achievements. After listening to the obstacle man's litany of objections, he finally asked, why do you constantly emphasize the obstacles in this proposition instead of the possibilities? The obstacle man responded, to be intelligent, one must always be realistic. And it is a fact that there are definite problems with this project. What attitude would you take toward these obstacles, may I ask? The other man unhesitatingly replied, what attitude would I take toward these obstacles? Why, I would just remove them, that's all. And then I would forget them. But, said the obstacle man, that's easier said than done. You say you would remove them and forget them. May I ask if you have any technique for doing this that the rest of us have never discovered? A slow smile came over the face of the other man as he said, Son, I've spent my entire life removing obstacles, and I never saw one yet that couldn't be removed, provided you had enough faith and guts and were willing to work. Since you want to know how it's done, I'll show you. He then reached into his pocket and took a card out of his wallet. He shoved the card across the table and said, there, read that. That's my formula. And don't give me a song and dance about how it won't work either. I know better from experience. The obstacle man picked up the card and with a strange look on his face, read the words to himself. Read them out loud, urged the other man. In a slow, dubious voice, he read, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The owner of the card put it back in his wallet and said, I've lived a long time and have faced a lot of difficulties, but there is power in those words, actual power, and with it you can remove any obstacle. He said this with confidence, and everyone knew he meant it. He was in fact a remarkable man who had overcome many odds and his successful track record spoke for itself. His positive attitude plus the fact that he was not in any sense holier than thou made his words convincing to the men around the table. At any rate, there was no more negative talk from the obstacle man or anyone else from then on. The project was put into operation and despite risks and difficulties, it turned out successfully. Think of the winning mentality that sports champions cultivate. 
when a game seems to be going against them, they can't let discouragement creep in. They can't let negative thoughts dominate or they will lose the power to win. To be a champion in your own arena, your mental and spiritual resources must be razor sharp with confidence. Now you may say, but you don't know my circumstances. I'm in a different situation than anybody else. And I'm about as far down as a human being can get. Well, if that's true, and you're down as far as you can get, in that case, congratulations, for you're at the bottom. And the bottom is a wonderful place. The only place you can go from the bottom is up. On the other hand, it's hard to say you're in a situation that no one has ever encountered before. There is no such situation. Practically speaking, there are only a few human stories, and they've all been enacted before. This is a fact we must never forget. There are people in this world who have overcome every conceivable difficulty, even the most hopeless, even the one in which you now find yourself. There is always a way out. A wise old man was once asked how he overcame the many difficulties of his life. How do I get through a trouble? Well, first I try to go around it. And if I can't go around it, I try to get under it. And if I can't get under it, I try to go over it. And if I can't go over it, I just plow right through it. Then he added, God and I plow right through it together. One way to help your subconscious become more positive is to eliminate certain expressions of thought and speech, which we'll call the little negatives. These little negatives clutter up the average person's conversation. And while each one is seemingly unimportant in itself, when taken together, they have a total effect of creating a negative mindset. If you analyze your own conversational habits, you may be shocked by what you find. See how often gloomy little statements creep in like, I'm afraid I'll be late, or what if I have a flat tire, or I don't think I can do that, or even I knew it was going to rain. These are little negatives to be sure, and a big thought is of course more powerful than a little one. But it should never be forgotten that mighty oaks from little acorns grow. And if a mass of little negatives clutters up your conversation, they're bound to seep into your mind. Soon they accumulate in force, and before you know it, grow into big negatives. Make the decision right now to go to work on your little negatives. Root them out of your thoughts and your conversations. The best way to do this is to say a positive word about everything. When you keep asserting that things are going to work out well, that you can do the job, that you will not have a flat tire, that you will get there on time, you invoke the law of positive effects. You will find that good results do occur. Things do turn out well. Now, as we've said before, our success in overcoming obstacles is greatly influenced by our attitude. In fact, most of our obstacles are actually mental in character. Ah, oh, you may object. My obstacles are not mental. Mine are real. Perhaps so but your attitude toward them is mental. Attitudes are created by a mental process, and what you think about your obstacles largely determines what you do about them. 
Take the attitude that you can't remove an obstacle, and you won't. But get the idea firmly fixed in your mind that the obstacle is not so great as you previously considered it to be. Hold on to the idea that the obstacle is removable. The very moment you begin to think in this manner, you inaugurate the process that will eventually remove your obstacle. If there's a difficulty which has defeated you for a long time, it's likely that you've told yourself for weeks, months, and even years that there's nothing you can do about it. When you emphasize only your inabilities, your mind gradually concludes that you are indeed incapable. And when your mind is convinced, you're convinced, for as you think, so you are. Armed with a new attitude, now take another look at that obstacle that's been bothering you. You will find that it isn't so formidable as you thought. Say to yourself, the rough is only mental. I think victory, I get victory. Remember that formula. Write it on a piece of paper, put it in your wallet, stick it over the kitchen sink, put it on your dressing table and on your desk, Keep looking at it until its truth permeates your whole mental attitude, until it becomes a positive obsession. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What may seem to be a difficult proposition is hard or easy depending upon how we think about it. Some of America's greatest thinkers tackled this question of attitude, and each came to the same conclusion. Ralph Waldo Emerson believed that the human personality can be touched with divine power, and through this channel, greatness is released. William James pointed out that the most important factor in any undertaking is one's belief about it. And Henry David Thoreau told us that the secret of achievement is to hold a picture of a successful outcome in mind. Over the years, I've frequently received letters from people who discovered just how practical the I don't believe in defeat approach can be. One man wrote to relate his father's story. My father was a traveling salesman, the letter began. Every year he changed the line of goods he would sell and tell my mother that this was the last change. He always said that next year our problems would be over and we would be on Easy Street. But Easy Street never happened and my father was always tense, always afraid of himself, always whistling in the dark. Then one day, a fellow salesman gave father a copy of a little three-sentence prayer. He was told to repeat it just before calling on a customer. Father tried it, and the results were almost miraculous. He sold 85% of all the calls he made the first week, and every week after that, the results were wonderful. Some weeks, his percentage ran as high as 95, and Father had 16 weeks in which he sold every customer he called on. Father gave this prayer to several other salesmen, and in each case, it brought astounding results. Here is the prayer. I believe I am always divinely guided. I believe I will always take the right turn in the road. I believe God will always make a way where there is no way. Obstacles exist all right, but even if we don't dream them up, most of the time they're not really as difficult as they seem. It's your attitude that counts. 
Your attitude, which gives obstacles their power or lack of power, to the degree that your attitude shifts from negative to positive, the ability to master your problems will come. You must believe that Almighty God has instilled in you the power to lift yourself out of the rough by keeping your eye firmly fixed on the source of your power. Affirm to yourself that through this power you can do anything you have to do. Believe that this power is taking the tension out of you, that his power is flowing through you. Believe this and a sense of victory will come. There is one simple exercise to practice. Say out loud, I don't believe in defeat. I don't believe in defeat. Continue to affirm that day and night until the idea completely dominates your subconscious. Eventually, you'll discover that the shortest path between you and your goal is a direct one, despite any obstacle in your way. Here you will discover the practical secrets that can lead to a life in which dreams are achieved and expectations are fulfilled. As Dr. Peel says, life cannot deny itself to the person who gives life his all. So, as you listen, keep in mind your most burning desire. Surely there's a way to make it come true. Have you been trained to believe? Are you convinced that you can successfully complete any task you set for yourself? Or are you a doubting Thomas? Do you shrink from even hoping for the things that you would love to accomplish? When you begin something, what do you really expect to happen? If you haven't been doing too well at achieving your goals, perhaps it's time to examine your expectations. It was William James who said, our belief at the beginning of a doubtful undertaking is the one thing that ensures the successful outcome of the venture. Rule number one, when there's something you want, learn to believe. The Bible teaches a technique for obtaining spiritual power, a method which emphasizes how a person can make something of himself. When released, this power can provide one of the greatest forces in human nature. Belief, positive thinking, Faith in God, faith in other people, faith in yourself, faith in life. This is the essence of the technique. If thou canst believe, it says, all things are possible to him that believeth. If you have faith, nothing shall be impossible unto you. According to your faith, be it unto you. Believe. Believe, believe, so it drives home the truth that faith moves mountains. For those who are serious about getting the best out of life, I will once again suggest that you read the New Testament. Notice the number of times it refers to faith. Select a dozen of the strongest statements about faith, the ones you like the best, then Memorize each one. Let these faith concepts drop into your conscious mind. Say them over and over again, especially just before going to sleep at night. By a process of spiritual osmosis, they will sink from your conscious into your subconscious mind, and in time, they will restructure your basic thought pattern. Believe that you are experiencing this upthrust of force. You will be amazed at the lifting power you will receive. Naturally, in this process of achieving the best, it is important to know where you want to go in life. You can reach your goals and make your dreams come true only if you know what you want. Lots of people get nowhere 
simply because they don't know where they want to go. They have no clear-cut, precisely defined purpose. You cannot expect the best if you think aimlessly. I was once consulted by a 26-year-old man who was dissatisfied with his job. He was ambitious to fill a bigger niche in life and wanted to know how to improve his circumstances. In the course of our conversation, I asked him, well, where do you want to go? The young man replied hesitantly, I don't know exactly. I've never given it any thought. I only know that I want to go somewhere other than where I am. Well, what can you do best? What are your strong points, I then asked. I don't know, the man responded. I never thought that over. But what would you like to do if you had your choice? What do you really want to do? I just can't say, came the response. I don't really know what I'd like to do. I never thought it over. Finally, I said, now look here. You want to go somewhere from where you are, but you don't know where you want to go. You don't know what you can do or what you would like to do. You'll have to get your ideas organized before you can expect to start getting anywhere. And that is a failure point with many people. They never get anywhere because they have only a hazy idea of where they want to go and what they want to do. No objective leads to no end. A newspaper editor, an outstanding man in his field, was once asked, how did you get to be editor of this important newspaper? I wanted to be, he said simply. Is that all there is to it? He was asked, you want to be, and so there you are? Well, that may not be all of it, but that was a large part of the process, he explained. I believe that if you want to get somewhere in life, you must make a clear decision about what you want to accomplish. Be sure it is a sound objective, then photograph this goal on your mind and hold it there. Work hard, believe in it, and the thought will become so powerful it will tend to assure its own success. I've found that there's a deep tendency to become what your mind pictures, provided the objective is sound and you hold the mental picture strongly enough. Then the editor pulled a well-worn card from his wallet and said, I repeat this quotation every day of my life. It has become my dominating thought. Here is what the card said. A man who is self-reliant positive, optimistic, and undertakes his work with the assurance of success, magnetizes his condition. He draws to himself the creative powers of the universe. It is indeed a fact that the person who thinks with positive self-reliance and optimism does magnetize his condition, and this releases power to attain a goal. Over and over again, we've seen that what the mind profoundly expects, it tends to receive. Think about that. Perhaps this is because the thing that you expect is what you actually want. Unless you want something deeply enough to create a dynamic atmosphere of positive factors, your desire is likely to elude you. Now here is a great law to meditate upon. Faith, power, works, wonders. Those four words are packed with dynamic and creative force. Hold them in your thoughts. Say them over and over again. Say them until your mind accepts them, until you believe them. Faith, power, works, wonders. You can overcome any obstacle. You can achieve the most tremendous things by faith power. And how do you develop faith power? As I've said before, the answer is to saturate your mind with the great words of the Bible. 
spend one hour a day reading the Bible and committing its great passages to memory. The change in you and in your experiences will be little short of miraculous. Just one section of the Bible will accomplish this for you. Chapter 11 of Mark contains one of the greatest formulas in the book. It's this, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now why does this passage use the word heart? Because it means that you are not to allow doubt into your subconscious, into the inner essence of you. And this doubt is not the kind of superficial doubt which normal, intelligent questioning raises. Rather, we are instructed to avoid the deep, fundamental doubt that obstructs the flow of faith. Another interesting thing to note about this passage is that we are told, ye shall say to this mountain. The reason great things don't happen to some people is because they aren't specific enough in their application of faith power. In other words, don't address your efforts to the entire mountain range of all your difficulties. Attack one problem at a time. Be specific. If there's something you want, what is the best way to go about getting it? In the first place, ask yourself, should I want it? Test the question very honestly in prayer to be sure you should want it and whether you should have it. If you can answer that question in the affirmative, then ask God for it and don't be backward in asking him. And if God, having more insight, believes that you shouldn't have it, you needn't worry, he won't give it to you. But if it is a right thing, ask him for it specifically. And when you ask, do not allow doubt in your mind. These principles were suggested to one man who perpetually expected the worst in all aspects of his life. He took a negative attitude toward every project or problem he faced and expressed a vigorous disbelief in these principles. In fact, he offered to conduct a test to prove them wrong. Since he was an honest man, he tried them faithfully and even kept a scorecard. After six months, he reported that 85% of his problems had turned out satisfactorily. I am now convinced, he said, although I wouldn't have believed it possible. It seems to be true that if you expect the best, you are given some strange kind of power to create conditions that produce the desired results. From now on, I am changing my mental attitude and shall expect the best, not the worst. My test indicates that this is not a theory, but a realistic way to meet life situations. May I say that I am very interested in you. So every day as you confront the problems of life, I suggest that you affirm as follows. I believe that God gives me power to attain what I really want. Never mention the worst. Never think of it. Drop it out of your consciousness. At least 10 times every day, repeat to yourself, I expect the best, and with God's help, will attain the best. If in the depths of your mind you visualize the best and employ the powers of faith and energy, you will get the best. If with all your heart, that is the secret. If with all your heart, that is to say, if you reach out creatively toward your heart's desire 
with your entire personality, your reach will not be in vain. So expect the best. Never think of the worst. Drop it out of your thoughts. Let there be no thought in your mind that the worst will happen, for whatever you take into your mind can grow there. So take in only the best. Nurture it, concentrate on it, emphasize it, visualize it, prayerize it, surround it with faith. Expect the best at all times and spiritually creative mind power, aided by God power, will produce the best. You have finished listening to these tapes. What have you heard? Simply a series of practical and workable techniques for living a successful life. You have heard a formula of belief and practice which should help you win victory over every defeat. Examples have been given here of people who have believed and who have applied the suggested techniques. But listening is not enough. Now please go back and practice each technique. They have been tested in the laboratory of spiritual and practical experience. When applied, they will work for you as they have worked for many. We may never meet in person, but through these tapes, I feel we have met. We are friends and partners, so believe and live successfully. Thank you and best wishes always, Norman Vincent Peale. been listening to Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. This has been a Simon & Schuster audio presentation. Recording engineer Ed Valentine, mixing engineer Gary Fink, writer Mary Bruton, executive producer Peg Colm. I'm Connie Goldman.